Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 46. This episode is one of my all-time favorite authors, Claudia Gray. And if you're listening to this show, you most likely know who she is. Apart from being an amazing author, she's also a fantastic person and hilarious. We had such a good time talking. Uh, we we uh, talked about different weather that we've survived uh, because she's in New Orleans. And, uh, you know, Katrina hit New Orleans. Luckily, she wasn't there. Uh, we talked about Mardi Gras, the proper way to enjoy New Orleans, how she got started writing. Uh, and then we even got into her Star Wars books, covered Lost Stars, uh, Bloodline, Leia, Princess of Alderaan. We even covered uh, we even covered that chapter in uh, From a Certain Point of View, guys. From a Certain Point of View, the Qui-Gon chapter. Anyone who follows me on Twitter knows I freaked when I read that. And it was really cool to be able to tell her how much I enjoyed it and appreciated it. Uh, but she's so fun. This was, re- this was really, really cool. Um, special thanks to her assistant, Sarah, uh, for setting this up. She's incredible. Um, yeah, so you know what? Uh, that's all you need to hear from me. Uh, let's just enjoy uh, the interesting podcast, episode number 46, with Claudia Gray. Theme song time. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, Claudia. Yes. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. I had a moment of panic upon realizing that my new laptop did not have Skype on it yet, but fortunately that was not too difficult a thing to take care of. Been there. I've had to change my Skype password probably close to 20 times, not exaggerating. Oh, oh my God. I'm just horrible. Horrible at memory <laughs> things and just, it's got to be one of five things. And then it's like this account. It's one of those like email or password is wrong. Uh-huh. It doesn't tell you which one it is. Told you like, oh, this password would have this many capitals <laughs> yeah, and it would have anything. <laughs> no clues, really? None at all? You could, <laughs> you could tell me if it was the, the email or the password? You're just one of them? <laughs> please, please. It's like somebody for a fact knows because you're telling me one of them is wrong. No. Uh-huh. It's, it's, they don't help at all. <laughs> zero which i suppose is the point but um that, that makes sense makes sense you know that good on them for the security but a uh, little too much little too much mm-hmm. i've always wondered like you know fingerprint scanners what happens yeah. if something happens to your finger are you just out, I, are you just out of luck i do not know if that would work uh i assume you would have to go through some kind of process with your bank or whatever but like the state department i have no idea has to be right then it's retina scans it's got to be something. We're headed. Um, we're headed that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to do uh, fingerprint scans when I come in from outside the U.S. now. So really, well, I signed up for global entry, and I mean, oh, okay. in exchange for the fingerprint scans, I don't have to stand in the line. So you know, fine. Fair. Good. 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 Uh, good exchange. I'd say yeah. so. That's mm-hmm. awesome. <laughs> so we you're have... you're in New Orleans. I am. Are you from New Orleans? Uh, not originally, but I always had family here. I lived here throughout the 90s, and I moved back uh, not quite seven years ago. Really? Where Where are you from? I'm originally Mississippi. Uh, I've lived all over. No way. What part? Uh, the Delta. Okay. Right on. Right on. So you were. You said you moved uh, back here seven years ago. So uh, shy of. I think I moved back in August of 2011, something like that. Okay, phew. so you weren't there in 05. I was not there in 05. I was there before and after, but not for Katrina. Ooh, and you had family? Did they make it all right? Uh, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, everybody's fine. Um, you know, my aunt and uncle weren't back in their house for two years. But, yeah. But, you know, the house ultimately came out okay, and you know, nobody was hurt. So um, pretty much everybody was displaced in some way, but is okay now. We were very lucky. Good, good, good. I just went through a hurricane down here in Florida. It was oh, nice. where are you in Florida? Uh, I'm in Naples. Ah. Yes, yeah, southwest, directly across from Miami. Like, if you go to Miami, <laughs> on the other coast, like, the same latitude. <laughs> okay. Or I guess it'd be longitude. 
Longitude is the horizontal, I think. I actually don't know. Sure, yeah, it is now. No, wait, no, no, no. Latitudes are um, are horizontal, and I'm embarrassed to say I know that because of Jimmy Buffett. Hey, you're, you know what? Change, latitudes changes in attitudes. That yeah. makes sense. Whatever works, you know. Thank whatever, you. However you learn, it works. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett's awesome. But yeah. yeah, we just we just went through a uh, Hurricane Irma, and uh, that was fun. I'm Which sure. Was uh oh man, it what was weird about that one was like they kept flip flopping the days leading up to it. It was like it's gonna hit Miami. No, it's gonna hit Naples. Just kidding, it's gonna hit Miami. So we didn't get like mandatory evacuation until the day <laughs> before, and then all the gas stations were out of gas, and it was like Mad Max time. Yeah, <laughs> so weird. We had like, uh, w luckily. Uh, where I'm at, we didn't lose power for, I think it was like four or five days. My parents lost it for like nine days. Uh, and I think around like day seven was when people are pulling guns on each other's sandwiches. Things went yeah. south so fast without AC in Florida. Yeah, yeah. It's like that New Orleans after Hurricane 2. You know, that first day, nobody has power. But, you know, right after the hurricane, the weather's great. Yeah, oh, it is. Oh, <laughs> it's the constellation for survival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, you know, and then about 36 hours after that, you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's no power. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Man, so weird. They're crazy. I've luckily never been in a tornado, though. I feel like those are significantly more scary. Yeah, I mean, smaller, but if it's coming at you, that's not good. I've, I've never been in one. There was one that hit here. I guess about three years ago and i was much closer to that than i hoped to be Ooh. but i well like tree limbs were coming down around me and stuff and i was like oh, you know man. i was in my car and there wasn't really anything i could do and i kind of went all the way from mortal terror to sort of the point of like none can know the hour yeah. you know? <laughs> that's right you know you have you just have to keep trying to get home that's all there is that's right uh, so, uh, and I did get home, but I lost, um, I had a old, I have an old house here and I had an old porch swing and the tornado broke apart. So it was close enough for jazz, I guess. Sheesh. I always, whenever I think of tornadoes, I always wonder what kind of belt Bill Paxton had on. Yeah. That, I mean, he should have bifurcated him right, right there. It would I not mean, have been good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever belt brand that is, it, it survived an, e, an F5, I think it's F's, E's or F's or EF's. It's, I, I, I think they usually just say F, but F. Um, I think my, I think technically it may be EF five. You know, and we very rarely get tornadoes down here. Yeah, and one not that one I was telling you about. Not long after that, uh -huh. we we actually had an F three in like New Orleans, yes. like within the city area. Fortunately, it was sort of the outskirts, but still like within the the area and i never forget this i was watching the news they're like okay we have some footage of the tornado and they put it up and the weather woman immediately she goes oh my god <laughs> like, oh this is not <laughs> they immediately cut the feed <laughs> oh my god you know she's like that is at least an after we do not see these around as much <laughs> like she, she was like oh that's not okay that's the only so, coverage you get it's just the weather woman oh my god cut to black um Hmm. Okay. <laughs> My favorite ever a few years back, but I was home for Miss at Mississippi for Christmas mm -hmm. and tornadoes were coming through Christmas Eve. It was all over the place. Oh. And we were watching the news, you know, and up in North Mississippi and this one weatherman, he was like, Brazil, Lock Station, Itabina. How often <laughs> do you hear me say the name of your town on television? Never. <laughs> That's how you know this is just safety. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. We we had one weather guy down here in Florida that was like, uh, you need to get out of there because you're going to die. And your kids are going to die, too. We're like, what is, what is happening? <laughs> Who let this guy say this stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you every once in a while, they lose it and they actually need to lose it. But yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, the guy who was like, you towns, you need to go. But he, he, he knew what he was doing. He's <laughs> yeah. like, I need to scare them because they don't think I mean it. Sure. Um, and, but poor, oh my God, like she cleared <laughs> off my guard. <laughs> That's what was happening completely. Oh, that is gold. I feel like they're also, they have to be extra like warning forward because they have to stay behind. Like I remember the weather people yeah. being like, we're in our bunker. Uh, we're going to be mm -hmm. safe, but uh, you need to leave. I was like, oh, man, yeah. can you imagine? 
for years and years, uh, I mean, he's deceased now, but all during like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I think into the 90s, there was a weatherman in New Orleans called Nash Roberts. Mm -hmm. And he was renowned for his hurricane tracking. Really? He was, he was extremely good. Of course, he's working with like, you know, a whiteboard and a marker. Sure. You know, and reports, but he was really well known for it. In fact, like, worked also several big oil companies like they talked to him to figure out like when they brought in guys off a rig or right, something okay you know he was kind of the guy sure anyway, and he was in there one evening and the hurricane was turning so you know things are calming down and and he said listen i just like to say one thing i would really like to thank my wife who has ridden out every hurricane alone Ooh. for the last few decades <laughs> wow what a woman I know you wouldn't, and it's like, oh, I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, Nash Roberts had to be there, and sure. his wife has to deal. Right. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever see that video of Jim Cantore and like the thunder snow? Mm. There's, there's this weatherman that, like, I guess, while okay. it's blizzard, super fe like feet and feet of snow, it's like lightning as well, and he's like, oh my god, just really, really excited. Yeah, yeah. I was. I think I'm, that was in Chicago. I was in Chicago for that. It, Were you it, really? It was yeah. It was in fact pretty awesome. <laughs> what? I didn't yeah. know that. How yeah. was, how was Thunder Snow <laughs> from a first hand account? It it was pretty epic. I mean, it really was because there were crazy winds. We're getting snowfall amounts that made Chicago shut down. You know, and they don't oh. shut down easy. Sure. <laughs> and normally, I I since have learned like if there's some snow, that means maybe you get a couple of rumbles of thunder. Okay. But it was going okay. like full thunderstorm what? you know sometimes you could see little flashes of lightning even uh it was it was pretty intense that's so cool we there were like internet memes coming around it's like if jim cantori comes to your town that's not good it's not good yeah. at all and he was yeah. like an hour from me during the hurricane we're like oh no this is no. <laughs> this is bad yeah, farther from jim cantori yeah <laughs> that's the cross he bears yes yes oh man i've been to new orleans once uh, I have a friend who lives there, and we went, I think it was like a year or two after Katrina, and that was my first time going, and I was like, oh boy, uh, hmm, Inter this is different than the movies. Uh, but it seemed to bounce back. It seemed to yeah, bounce back. Um, I mean, obviously there are areas that bounce back better than others, um, you know, when you had both low income areas and lower ground, Oh yeah, the, those areas still really have had a lot of... Uh, trouble uh but the majority of the city looks as good if not better than it did before you know they've built in bike lanes they've really built up the streetcar lines more yeah. and it got almost just a little tourist thing and now you know you can actually move around on it some um it's become a viable transportation option um yeah i mean i think you have this weird misapprehension uh, people seem to think we're still walking around in hip waders or something. Down. <laughs> you still travel by kayaks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I had friends who were going around like in canoes. That's you know? awesome. <laughs> but that's just not, that's just not the issue anymore. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the way things are going, we have to look to be more of an issue as time goes on. Right. But I'll be about that later. Yeah. Cross that bridge when you get to it or build yeah. that bridge when you need it. <laughs> being being it below from yeah. Florida being like six feet below sea level. Mm -hmm. Anytime a hurricane's coming, you just get one person that's like, Well, you know it's gonna happen eventually. It's like, No, 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 we'll be fine. Oh God. Katrina was the storm that people had been dreading for years and yes. years. That was the one foretold. Yeah, and actually it was I mean, you remember it wasn't the storm itself. It was the levee breaking. Yeah, they, it dumped so much water mm -hmm. uh, in the river that, that, and the lake that that broke. At first, it looked like the city had dodged a bullet. But... Right. That's a, that, that was the thing that they kept warning us about was like, they said the storm is going to pass us. Because we were actually in the eye of the hurricane for like 20 minutes, which was nuts. Because it, like, it was like a high category three uh, mm. in Naples. And it's so weird. Like, you hear wind and crazy rains and stuff, and then just dead quiet for like a half an hour you're like what? <laughs> and, and everyone's like going out we're like it's safe it's like no you, you don't understand when it starts back it's starting back full speed again yeah <laughs> and that, like, that was so take sweet. five minutes look around get back exactly enjoy it while you can 
and then get back inside because you're not going to be able to close these shutters when it gets started. No, this uh, is when you take the dogs out. Let's do that real quick. Okay. Exactly, exactly. And they were telling us, they're like, the hurricane's going to be bad. What's going to be worse is the storm surge. And it's like, that's mm-hmm. what you need to worry about because they were telling us like 15 feet of water. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, well, uh, we're going to lose everything. This is awful. Uh, and luckily, it's it hit us, and then instead of going right up the road along the beach like it was projected to, it went mm-hmm. way more inland. So there was next to no storm surge where we were. Yeah, and, it, it couldn't pick up water anymore. Exactly, exactly. Crazy weather's crazy. Yeah, that is. It's um, y- if you really want to depress yourself about humanity, sometime go to the National Hurricane Center. And go into their frequently asked questions. Yeah. And just the display of not understanding. Yeah. <laughs> like, why don't we use a nuclear bomb on the hurricane? Yeah. Why don't we <laughs> shoot it? <laughs> yeah, so that's a frequently asked question. Oh, my God. Like, <laughs> that was another uh, thing that was said on the news here. The, like, don't shoot the hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it, people. <laughs> It's like, I know you Florida people are thinking about it. I see you, Florida man. Do not yeah. shoot into the hurricane. <laughs> oh, that bullet whip around and get you. Can you imagine if that's your, the way you go? <laughs> if you fire the gun, that you may deserve it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, that's I just Darwinism. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. I, I mean, I'm going to ask the stereotypical question. Have you been to Mardi Gras? You have oh, to have, right? Course. Can't you can't not? Of course, Mardi Gras this year actually um, mostly didn't because um, I was having some work done on my house at the time, so my mm-hmm. boyfriend and I were temporarily living uh, across the lake. Uh-huh. But um, you know, so we weren't here for the thick of it. But I did march in Barkus, which is the parade of costume dogs. Oh, sweet. Uh, my- yeah, my dog was a cup of coffee, and I was the Starbucks mermaid. That is amazing. It was fun. What? So, what are what what is Mardi Gras like from for someone who's never been? What what should I expect when I go? Well, it depends on what kind of experience you're determined to have and who you're there with. Oh, okay. The experience that a tourist has if they stay primarily in the French Quarter is going to be very radically different from the way that locals experience it that makes sense um the parades wind through many different parts of town you know where i am we would be more likely to catch a parade uptown you know of course there are still tourists there sure. but but you know it's a whole lot of local people um a big experience like everybody talks about this at carnival when you're walking around in the parade you see people you haven't seen in a long time you're like hey you know like this is where you run into your neighbors and that person who was in that book club etc you just sort of reconnect with all of that right uh, and you know people are in the parade whether that's on the floats or dancing or you know, in one of the other creative groups that goes through mm-hmm. so it, it has more of sort of a community vibe to it. You know, and i mean don't when we drink but sort of the goal is to sort of like get a buzz maintain gotcha that makes sense because you know the the heart of the you know parade season lasts about a month and there's two solid weeks of it at the end you know you can't you can't go after it hardcore all that time you'd kill yourself and also you know people bring their kids to the parades and stuff like that so um you know you would just sort of be chilling out with your plastic cup full of whatever it is you're drinking talking with your neighbors you know waiting for your friend who dances in the organ grinders to come along and cavort in front of you sure sure that makes sense that makes sense and if you wanted to go for a more what would you recommend someone who doesn't want to do say the touristy route of new orleans to experience the real new orleans if you will Uh, let's see i would try to find you know a local somebody you know or somebody you know, you know, the question of who will host you at Mardi Gras gets really fluid. Usually it's like, are, you know, do you know the homeowner or do you know someone the homeowner has heard of? You know, right. like sometimes right. people wind up on your sofa there. <laughs> uh, but it's it's really good. It's also especially good if you can be near a route. A lot of people who live near parade routes will just have open houses for one or more of the parades. Oh. And so people who know them and their friends, which, you know, believe me, I've been to somewhere I was 
very a very tertiary connection yeah. but you come in and there's food and there's alcohol and everybody sits around and talks and and chills out uh and it's just it's just a really nice experience a lot of the time but yeah you'll you'll want to connect with somebody local i mean you must have some friend someone you're in florida you can hunt somebody up yeah we'll but, out. yeah uh i would that would be my main recommendation would be t- kind of to do that and and also the like the weekdays before mardi gras itself like the the wednesday thursday and friday sort of of that weekend it, the, the stuff really gets nuts on saturday and sunday sure but, but uh the knicks muses and oh god how many parades are there on friday i think it's hermes and crudita and something else um like those are amazing or you can come a weeks early and go to some of the little walking parades like chewbacca's which is a science fiction walking crew what that is the best name i've ever heard yeah, I marched with them two years ago in the sub crew called Be the Darth Vegas. <laughs> yeah, I was I was uh, Obi Wan Newton. Oh that was my... my god, that's amazing! It was fun. I had I had a trading card and everything. It was pretty great. What? Yeah, uh, or they have Crew de Vue, the pun being on crude view, which is incredibly obscene. I can't <laughs> like I'm not I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding at all. Like. People will take their kids, but it's like, and then you have the talk. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is that? Oh, boy, we're doing this now, are we? <laughs> but, yeah, as a friend of mine said last year, his daughter's on his shoulder going, Daddy, there are a lot of boy parts in this parade. <laughs> He's like, yes, there are, honey. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, I went to Fantasy Fest in Key West mm-hmm. um, accidentally when I was, like, 11. Uh, oh, that's an experience that you don't forget. Yeah. Same, same sort of theme, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just naked people everywhere. Uh, but yeah. that, so- that sounds awesome. It sounds very, very communal, which is how I picture New Orleans. Just food and music. Yeah. Is, that's very cool. It's very rare. Yeah, I would say. it really is. This is one of the last cities where people will just go out and do something because it would be cool or fun. For people, you know, and sure. nobody's trying to monetize it. You know, you pay money to take part yeah. in Mark. Um, you know, but I know a number of people, you know, they're professional dancers. They're just normal people, but they're in dance troops. Or you have the Laze boys who are people who have motorized recliners and tricked them out with like dry ice and LED. They, they do like, you know, performance writing. You know, I have a friend who's in that. Um, another friend is part of a group called the Disco Amigos that does this. Um, you know, people, it, it really is a thing that encourages you taking part in some way, you know, even if it's just dressing up when you go to the parade or, or something. And it, it's really remarkable how many people do participate in some, in some form or fashion. Sure. Those names are amazing. That's so, okay. cool. <laughs> That's so cool. And just like the, the, the culture and the art that comes into that. That's so neat. Is that is that like has to have been one of the reasons why you chose New Orleans to live, right? Yeah, it it really is. This is one of I always say it's one of the last places that really feels like nowhere else. You know, where sure. everything is really getting more and more homogenized. Absolutely, all the time. You know, it's very hard to tell. You could drive through sort of the outskirts of several cities and just have no idea. You'd be in Indianapolis. You could be in Sacramento. You could be in the outskirts of Atlanta. You know, I mean, it's going to be the same sort of chain stores, the same sort of look, same sort of whatever. And I'm not saying we don't have some chain stores out in the whatever, but mm-hmm. if you're in New Orleans, you know you're in New Orleans. Yeah. <laughs> it's The food is, the music is different. The architectural styles are different. Yeah. It's, it's just, it is still, it's very much its own place and a place that really encourages a lot of creativity on and just exuberance on the part of people. I mean, this is not a big town. It's about 350,000 people. Sure. It's livelier than places five times that big. Absolutely. That's yeah. so cool. I yeah. It. It's like it's like, it, like a celebration of life. That's mm-hmm. awesome. That's so awesome. Yeah, it really, really is. Man, so am I, uh, am I correct in what I read that you live in a super old house? Uh, yeah, I mean, actually not by New Orleans standards, but by general standards, yeah, it's uh, from uh, 1895. Right on. Uh, yeah. Is that something you always wanted to do, live in, like, 
those kind of houses. I hear it's purple. Is it purple? It is purple. Hey, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, which again, in New Orleans, not unusual. Right, that uh, makes sense. Huh? That makes sense. Purple yeah, in New Orleans. Okay. Yeah, the people next to me are sort of melon orange, and the people across the street are turquoise blue. You know, um, it beige is just how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> it it's, once things turn beige, that's when you know you've hit the city limits. Basically, yeah. You do see a few, but there are people in from out of town who are trying to flip a house. And of course, ah. it's so painted a neutral color, and they do this, and then they wonder why it takes it a long time to sell. For because real. People who live here are like, oh, we'd have to repaint it right away. You, know? <laughs> you don't want to be the one person in the lame colored house. Seriously. <laughs> That's like, it's just sad. That's just sad. I All the colors of the rainbow and, and you go for beige. But. I gotta say, it is, so, it is a really cool to know that an author is living amongst this, this place of just life and celebration and culture and music. It's just, it's got to be super like creative feeling. You know, you're like, you got to be inspired by stuff like this. Yeah. I mean, I've never written anything about New Orleans or anything said here. I feel like that's sure. inevitable someday, but, but it's just, it's, it's a place where it's not very hard to find interesting things to do and to see or to be in places that are really authentically very beautiful. Yeah. I mean, just walking down the street near my house, we have all these big, you know, 200 year old oaks and everything. And because it doesn't snow, I mean, you know how it is. The oaks, the branches just go and they go out and out and out and they dip back into the ground and come back up again, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and that's, that's a block and a half from my house. It's just this huge street lined with that. And the nearest coffee house is in like an old bank building from the 1920s with like 30 foot ceilings and what? You know, marble arches and business, you know, and I mean, it's just, it's so easy to be someplace that is, is beautiful and different. That's so cool. Yeah. Any, any sort of history, like, especially nowadays, you know, they put stuff down, build new stuff. It's like, if you can find anything that's even a little old, it's like, ah, mm -hmm. cool. Like, I remember yeah. going to London, and I'm like, there are apartments here that are older than my country. <laughs> yes, yes. And also, like, my house, the bulk of it is from 1895. In about 1982, somebody put a small addition on the side. Right. And years ago, I had it really checked out top to bottom. There were tons of problems with the 1982 park. Mm -hmm. 1895, solid. Wow. Did nothing. like Because back then, you know, they built stuff to be there forever. Sure. You know, and 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 also, I'm on very high ground. This house has never taken water right on. in any floods, so you know it hasn't had that kind of damage either. Sure. So, um, but yeah, sounds like a good buy. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, and I mean, it's true about a lot of things, though. You know, my my father has kept my grandmother's stove, which I think is from like 1948. Sure. You know, that thing would outlast the nuclear apocalypse. You know. <laughs> sure. So, you bought 10 years ago is probably breaking down. It's true. It's so horrible. Like, I feel the same way about cars. Uh -huh. like, all of The newest car I've ever owned is, I think the one I'm driving right now, which is like an O2. Mm -hmm. And I, I grew up with like dad teaching me how to work on cars because we can never afford a mechanic because they're so expensive. Mm -hmm. And now that I see all these new cars, I'm like, half of this is a computer. It's like your, your car could be totally fine. But if a sensor goes out, it's broken yeah. and things are just so much more breakable now. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it it or like my boyfriend has a juicer oh, from sweet. about 1965. Uh huh. And again, that thing. I mean, we actually joke. It kind of looks like a droid from Star Wars. <laughs> this thing, but I mean, it is. It's unbreakable. This thing is 50 years old. It's completely intact and strong. Even looks pretty good. Uh, does a great job. Whereas you know, a couple of years ago, he had a new one which broke after 18 months. Wow. You know? And you just use the old one, beat up the younger one. Like, you broke it. <laughs> you could. You could. Man, that's crazy. So when did you start writing? Uh, let's see. I I always wrote, mm -hmm. you know, but um, with any direction, I didn't really start until I started writing X-Files fanfic. In oh, about sweet. So much of it. What and kind? I must... Can't just gloss over that. <laughs> I'm I'm not being facetious here. Like I have written so much fan fiction and so many fandoms 
<laughs> like I can't, I can't narrow things down that much for you. That's you know, fair. What, That's what fair. did you write? I'm, what did I not write? Yeah. <laughs> I never wrote Stargate. There you go. Yeah. No uh, was the truth out there, there, Claudia? Was it? Uh, well, based on the last season, it certainly was not. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, the biggest problem with Chris Carter's X Files is Chris Carter. It always has been. It's like. <laughs> This guy created this awesome thing and does not seem to have any understanding of what people love about it. Sure, sure. <laughs> how, how, what, how? Um, but, you know, I I wrote tons and tons of that, really, for about a decade. And I finally had a couple of stories go con. I mean, kind of viral insofar as fan fiction does. Sure. Um and I was like, well, you know, maybe maybe I could try this. And uh, at the time, I was writing in Buffy the Vampire Slayer fandom. So I wound up... Interesting segue. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, well, I mean, I went through many fandoms on the way there, my friend. Uh, <laughs> and I was not done with the fanfic yet. I'm, I'm still not, technically. <laughs> Good. But, um, but uh, where was I? Oh, Buffy. yeah, so I wrote something that involved vampires and young people mm-hmm. and then sort of stupid dumb luck you know started knocking on doors in new york the week basically that publishing houses were going this thing called twilight is selling well um yeah. you know, really the dawn of the current young adult market and i got very very lucky on being like right there with what they wanted right when they wanted it in a lot of ways i was really not ready to be published yet uh but I uh, you know it it worked out very well for me. I'm not gonna knock it. Sure, sure. I mean, you've had a bunch of writing ahead of time, so it's like you kind of. I've come to learn having uh, people on the show that like, it, it's very true in most cases that luck is preparation meets opportunity. Mm-hmm. And it's like the it you had all this fan fiction under your belt. Fan fiction is still writing. It can still be oh, yeah. really, really, really good. So yeah, like, I, yeah. I actually really want to put together a workshop for about like for people who have written fanfic who want to go pro Ooh. because, um, you know, there were a lot of things I did learn from fanfic. There's something that doesn't teach you and everybody goes, Oh yeah, sure. World building, you know, or it's like, that's really not the issue so much because if you're writing, particularly in multiple um, fandoms, you, you begin to learn at least what good real world building looks like. Right. You begin to understand, you know, because you're in there trying to play with that Rubik's cube, you know, sure. and, can sort of see how it's constructed but there are other things that you don't necessarily touch on and i did not know those were coming and um a lot of it has to do with sort of the connective tissue of a book uh fanfic often doesn't have that connective tissue and nobody cares and because everybody's familiar with the source material why bother sure uh, but if you're in an original book and it's not giving you that, you are going to feel very confused as a reader. And as a writer, you have to learn how to get that in. Sure. Uh, and there are other things, too. But I think I think it would be really interesting to put a workshop like that together. I think so, too, especially given how massive the fanfic community is. That's really oh, yeah. that's a really cool idea. Yeah, I, th- I think it's something that there would be interest in. So I, I'm hoping to do that. For sure. I've got some friends that... Uh, have gone to other panels at writing and stuff, and it's so interesting to hear uh, people's different processes. Like mm-hmm. the the craziest one I ever heard was like they only wrote the dialogue, and they only wrote the locations, and then would go back and like fill it in, like almost like painting but by color. Do all the green, and then do all the red, and then do all the blue. It's like what is what is your process when you're attacking a book? Do you have like notes everywhere? Do you have it drawn out? A basic storyline where you kind of fit it as you go. I'm I'm still kind of doing that thing. Have you seen that little video of the cat that they let it have <laughs> face with the mint toothpaste? Like yes. the, it's, it's like dum dum da dum. Basically, my eyes are doing that at the thing of the dialogue and the sets. Is, uh, you know, just putting that down. I'm like, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> um. All right. Let me let me pull out of that. Um. <laughs> no, I live there, Claudia. I live there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Generally speaking, I come up with a premise first, and okay. then once I have the premise, I'm sort of like, okay, who is the most interesting person in in this premise? Somebody that would be challenged by this. And then once you have this person and you know a few things about them, you're like, okay, well, then what would need to be happening in the story to sort of bring this out? And 
you know, it's not character first or plot first. Sort of the two things tend to evolve each other. Oh. Um, the the project I'm working on next actually was the first one where I had to go, you know, I actually need way more world building on this before I turn to the rest of it. Sure. Uh, but that that was unusual for me. Um, I come up with an outline. I'm a very big outliner. Um, and I write through beginning to end. I don't really add no anything. Like if I think of something for later, I may go leave a note. Right. But yeah, beginning to end. Um, that makes it, sense. This, well, I also, I tend to get really, I like my endings. I tend to really be excited about them and eager to write them. So that just sort of turns into the carrot on the end of the stick. You that know, makes I, sense. You know, have to get through the rest of it and make it fun before I can get to write that cool thing by the end. Right, right. What What do you write on? Because I know, like, George Martin has, like, a super old computer. Um, I, I write on a laptop. Uh, I don't understand how people who handwrite do it. I certainly could not. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I have a laptop, currently a MacBook. Um, I work in a number of different places. I mean, I have an office, and I do work in there in my house. Mm-hmm. But I also, um, you know, will go to coffee houses or work in my front room or in the yard or something like that uh just for variety sake, because sure. particularly on deadline it's like you know you need something yeah uh, of course you know i've just gotten a little adjustable thing so i can stand occasionally and sit sometimes oh so, right on. yeah nice um yeah I, I really would love to try uh you're familiar with kevin j anderson oh yes i am yeah. a huge kevin j anderson fan yet yeah, he uh dictates he goes what? like hiking every morning and dictates. That is amazing. For three hours, comes home, uh, eat. You know, if he needs to edit that, he'll edit it. If he feels really good about it, he has his assistant just type it up, and then he edits it. And like, and he's done for the day. What? I know. I've, I've achieved this kind of superpower, but <laughs> I knew he was magic beforehand. But now we have audio confirmation. I mean, how do you even get the dictation thing to understand what you're saying? Because believe you me, mine does not. Yeah. <laughs> that is insane. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I envy that. I'm I'm really trying to open my mind to doing things in different ways. My my general method works really well for me. Sure. And I, it's not like, oh, I have to be done with this or I have to do something else. But I don't want to get locked into trying. Oh, other yeah, of course. Things. Um, I think a lot of times people get way too set in their ways on that. Uh, and it can be difficult with different transitions. So I'm trying to say like, okay, could I dictate things? Could I, um, write down the dialogue in this place? <laughs> Sorry, the cat's doing the mint toothpaste thing again. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's really only one way to find out. Yeah. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's only one way to know. That's right. So, we'll come uh, out, you'll come out with one book that we're like, this is very different. And it'll just have a footnote that says dictated. Yes. <laughs> something like that. Something like that. That's right. But, um, yeah. And of course, Kevin is incredibly fit and can eat whatever he wants. Yeah, so, of course. Some people, you know, some people are just yeah, awful like that. Not like a really cool guy. You would have to hate him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talent, fitness, and can dictate. Ugh, yeah. God. It's how dare you be nice? This guy. I know. I know. What's he doing? Yeah. Making everyone else look subhuman. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Kevin J. Anderson and the Troglodytes. That's right. <laughs> That's his 60s band. You know? yeah. uh, he's the best. Uh, so uh, a question I always have for writers as well. How do you name your characters? Because I used to write tiny little stories like in electrical, just, you know, as kids do. And I would always name them like I was into Bruce Lee. So I'm like, this one's name is Bruce. And this one is going to be Jackie because Jackie Chan. Yeah. <laughs> just um, making up names. Yeah. Uh, it's a combination of things. But generally, um, I try to think about their parents or who, wherever they would have gotten their name. Like what, what oh. would – or that organization, whatever. What name would they pick? First of all, because it makes me think about the people. Yeah. And think about that, which because that's an important thing to know about your characters going in, and also that's how we get our names. Absolutely, you know? and I think it helps set that a little bit. Um, you know, and of course you can play around with it from there, but uh, you know, I try to think. My first book, 
you know, the character's mother was sort of like Sarah Connor of, of vampire hunting. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and his name was Lucas because it was going to be something really short, really no nonsense. He was known as, like, you know, Sebastian Gideon. Yeah. <laughs> like that, he was not going to have a name like that. Right. Uh, and the heroine, um, she was going to be immortal. And and her parents named her Bianca because it was out of Shakespeare. Right. And they were several hundred years old themselves. And they knew that Shakespeare doesn't go out of style. Names do. You right. know. Go back 120 years and like all the cute girls named Mildred and Bertha. Mm-hmm. And that's not happening now. <laughs> and like, well, okay, Bianca may go out of style. But even if it does, you'll be able to say, my parents love Shakespeare. That That is probably still going to be a really valid thing to say for another four to five hundred years. Yeah, that is genius. Taking like an in-universe way to look at it as opposed yeah. to like, I'm going to name you this because I like this. It's like, well, you have parents. What would they have named you? That's crazy. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, that's yeah. generally what I do. I mean, some name will come and you're like, that's just too great. You got to go with that. Right. And of course, Star Wars, you have to find the whole thing of it's sort of familiar, but not quite. Right. You right. know, you have to just walk that line and, and figure that out. And that, you know, that's nothing but an insane thing. You just kind of have to go with it. Um, it's, more, it's more of a feeling. Really, yeah, really the only Star Wars character that I named with any sort of other intent um, was uh, from Bloodline. There's a character called Ransom Castrofo. Yes, there is. And the name Castrofo was actually given to me um, from Lucas. Apparently the character was in a very early version of The Force Awakens. Really? Yes, very, very early. Um, and But he had no first name. Right. Uh, and... And sort of the way I was structuring that book, you know, I had, it was it's a book about Princess Leia. Yes, it is. It's and, incredible. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> established from the beginning, like Luke is not in it. Correct. And Kylo Ren, not in it. Originally, Han wasn't supposed to be in it, but I really dug my heels in and was like, listen, if the things that are happening in this book are happening, Han's going to come home. Right. You know, it's not broken up at this point. He, he's going to come home. Yeah. And and they ultimately agreed, but again, he's not in a lot of the book. Sure, you know he is a small thing, and I liked the chance to tell a Leia story that really was completely independent. Yeah, because um, you know she got in the old EU, she got to be a Jedi Knight. She did, but but at the same time, she didn't really get to be the focus a lot. That is true. You know, and a lot of times she was like doing the boring thing. Right. You know, oh, Leia's back in the Senate, you know. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, and I really love the idea, like, yes, this is all through her. But at the same time, I was thinking, you know, a mother who is without her son is thinking about her son. Right. You know, a yeah. wife who's without her husband is thinking about her husband. A sister without a brother is thinking about that brother. And so Castrofo, in some ways, he hits a lot of the notes that those people would. And, you know, he's filling a gap. In some ways, you oh, know, yeah. absolutely. Uh, you know, he's this young person that she's mentoring a bit. You know, uh, he's somebody she can sit down and have these really thoughtful discussions with. He's also somebody who is very kind of dashing and can drive her completely insane. You know, <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know, and cover all that. So I liked having sort of the ties to the other men in her life. And then this tie is meaningless, but you know, father's name is Bail Organa, and so it was like Bail Ransom. Oh There's- my God, that's amazing. Yeah, so just threw an L in there so it would look a little more uh, spacey. I, L's are spacey, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> of course they uh, are. <laughs> yeah, that was the only one that had any sort of um, like back- other meat. Yeah, it. okay, okay. Just, so like, Sounds cool, you know. It does. It, it worked very well. Uh, I Another question I have. So when you wrote the Evernight series, right, mm-hmm. it was four books. Did you know it was going to be four books from the beginning? Or were you like... You I did. did. I was offered a four book uh, deal and, you know, I had the first book, but I knew other things would happen. I thought I was so smart. I'd come up with a plan <laughs> for three books and a plan for five. Ha. They bought four. Yeah. Um, and I actually learned a lot by doing that. I mean, of course, you're going to learn a lot doing your first four books. Yeah. But really plotted and planned a lot for the entire series from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. 
And I think especially in fan culture, we tend to glorify that, like, oh, they've known for seven years that it was all going to be right here, you know? Right, right. And I realized about halfway through book two, it was like, why did I believe that at no point in the next four years I would have a good idea? <laughs> and, uh, like, That's why fair. did I... Yeah, it's like, why did I not think that spending more time with these characters would generate different concepts, you know? And sure. I had... You know, I'd planned ahead, but I planned ahead to such an extent that, you know, I was I was fenced in, and right. uh, I've gotten better since then at figuring out like, okay, here's how you can have a meaningful arc in the middle, but not put too many things out there. Like, you know, I know there are a couple points I'm going to hit. I know that ultimately we may have to reach a, this resolution, right? But you know, you will have ideas as you go. You know, you will spend more time with these characters. You will get to know them better. Um, you and I feel like it's important to leave yourself some room for that. For sure, especially creating something like that. Yeah, that's funny. Four books. Uh, yeah, so, man, you just you learn so much by doing, huh? <laughs> you do, you do. There's there's really nothing else for it. You know, people are always sort of like, "What is your advice for writers?" and the main thing is like write all the time. That's there really isn't much else. Sure. And it's amazing how many people do not do that step. Oh yeah, that nobody wants to hear that because it's like, how do you do it? Just do it. You're like, there's no way it's that easy. It's like, tell me what kind of pen I need. You know, tell me what kind of software I need to write this book. What kind of paper? It's like, dude, just yeah. write. Yeah. Yeah, that's too yeah. easy. It's too easy, Claudia. Yeah. <laughs> that and also, I think people get discouraged too quickly. You know, because for sure. You're First 10,000 pages aren't going to look the way you hoped they would. Most you know, of mine, fortunately, were X-Files fanfic. Right. You know? <laughs> um, but I, I think people, you know, too often sort of look at that first chapter and it's not at all the way they thought it would be. And they think, I can't do this. Instead of, you know, you, you've just completed steps, you know, one through five of 10,000. Sure. And that's the other thing people got to remember is they're comparing their first, second, third, tenth draft to somebody's hundredth final draft. Yeah. You know, that's that. And, yeah. Well. And the editors work on and, and yeah. help. Yeah. I was actually re listening to, are you familiar with the uh, podcast Always Take Notes? Yes. I was listening to the one uh, with Peter Frankopan today. Right. Uh, and uh, the guy who wrote The Silk Roads. And he used a phrase that I loved. He said, by the end of the book, the writer is snow blind. And I was like, that's it. That's exactly ah. it. You know, it's just you think you know, but you know it too much. You've seen it too much. Sure. Mm. That makes uh, sense. Yeah, so you get that other voice and that other point of view, and you've had that reaction. Uh, and it, it, you know, unless your editor is absolutely terrible, your your book's going to be the better for that. Right. Right. Editors are super important mm -hmm. from everyone that I've talked to about them. So you you have this series under your belt, and then next thing you know, you're writing for one of the biggest franchises ever. Huh. I wrote a, uh, another trilogy, the Spellcaster trilogy. You which did. was Yeah, that was enjoyed by dozens of people worldwide. <laughs> and, um, but then I came on and did the Firebird trilogy, which uh, is about the daughter of two famous scientists. She's chasing her father's killer through alternate dimensions. I had a blast writing those books, uh, and and that did better. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, out of the blue, I got an email, you know, like, Star Wars. And uh, actually, my agent called me. I was at a gas station. And she's like, did you see that email? I was like, what email? Was the one that says Star Wars. <laughs> pulling out my phone right away. And, um, you know, they, they wanted to talk. And... You know, I had to sort of come up with an outline, and they liked the outline, and of course that was Lost Stars. Ooh, Lost Stars was incredible. Oh, thank uh, you. I, you know, let's talk about Lost Stars. Lost Stars, okay. I absolutely loved because I, I, I talk about it all the time when I talk about <laughs> context of both sides. I was uh -huh. like, we've never seen from the Imperial side of Alderaan blowing up from someone who's from Alderaan. That scene was crazy powerful. The you know, the whole book is powerful, I'm not going to lie. But <laughs> so, I'm really glad you enjoyed it. I mean, and actually, that was one of the things. You know, I think some people come in with the idea that the Star Wars people are very controlling about what you write. But, you know, they came to me and said for that book, what they said was, we want 
you know, two childhood friends, this idealistic girl and this angry guy, and they have this bond even though the war begins and she joins the rebellion and he joins the empire. You know, and I came back and said, no, no, the idealistic girl has to be the one in the empire and the angry dude has to be the one in the rebellion. And immediately so they, they said, okay. You know, they were fine with it. Yeah. Because I both wanted somebody you wouldn't think of as an aerial. And, you know, for all that, you know, Thane is committed, he's really not the kind of guy in the rebellion that we mostly have seen in the movies. Very true. He's he's a skeptic about the force. He's never comfortable with Luke Skywalker pulling up the Death Star. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's he's um to the end of his life probably he's gonna think like Grand Moff Tarkin was such a cool dude. Right, right. Because as far as he knows he was, you know. Um Sure. And then Sienna being like the good person is like uh, sticking her to the Empire. To the very end where you literally have to like knock her out and be like, We're coming this way. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. She's because, I mean, at some point, and actually it's really interesting because I feel like The Last Jedi touched on this. Mm -hmm. The yeah. Last Jedi is fundamentally about facing your mistakes. Yes. And the fact that you cannot move forward with any hope for the future unless you face this in the past. Right. You know, and ultimately that's the tragedy of Ben Solo, Kylo Ren. You know, it, he's not happy. He's miserable. Yeah, he's oh, yeah. He's completely miserable. But he cannot turn around and say, I made a mistake. I did the wrong thing. Yep. He can't do that. And so he's trapped there. For and sure. you know, to a much lesser degree, <laughs> that is where Sienna is because she's put so much of her, her faith and her belief you know, and her dedication as a good person and a person who's sort of living true to her culture into serving this. And she knows that there are good people there and she wants to – you know, she feels like that's who she's working with. That who, that's who she's serving. Sure. Uh, you know, and it gets harder and harder. You know, it gets worse, but it gets harder to step away, not easier. For sure. And I, I love that her her tribe is, you know, so about honor. And it's like you gave your word, you took this oath. Like, it is what it is. And mm -hmm. was it was it always the plan to write it from the alternate perspectives? Like Sienna and then Thane yes. and Switch? Yeah, it was always, I mean, I think it mixes up more in the beginning, but yeah. especially like the, I think at some point the chapters just break down and there's a Thane and there's Sienna, Thane, yeah. Sienna. Um, but yeah, that was always the idea. Gotcha, gotcha. It was the perfect way to do it, especially like opposing sides of a war. It was, mm -hmm. it was so good. I really, really, really liked it. How long did it take you to write it? Um... Well, I will say that when uh, Star Wars sent that first email, my agent and I assumed that the year was a typo. <laughs> oh, no. No, they, they meant this year. <laughs> oh, God. Um, you, you don't get a ton of time on it. Um, That's the price. I mean, they work through the outlines, but you don't want to really begin until the outline is fully okay because sure. you don't. And I guess I probably had about two and a half months or something with that. Uh, I really wow. had to hard like i remember on christmas day that year like i went over to my late grandmother's house which is mostly empty and just like worked over there for about four hours and you know i was like really Man. but i was time i really was it's a long book yeah, uh i had a blast with it and it's 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 been really well received which yes i was not expecting because you know some of the message boards beforehand you know were like i don't want to be in my star wars you know they're you Plenty of those. Yeah, well, you know, I, I tried not to too much, but <laughs> so you're still also human. Fan, so I would just trip over stuff, you know. Sure. You know, and you know, there were. I think plenty of people were open, but there were definitely some people who were not. And have the fandom like really embrace the book, especially because it's about original characters. It is. It has been really wonderful. Sure, and then it's like you said earlier, where like. Star Wars is a lot, almost more a feeling than anything else. And these characters felt very, very Star Wars. Uh, I dug it. I dug it a lot. So from there, were you like, okay, this did well. Can I take a swing at Leia? Or did they come to no, you? That's not what happened. <laughs> um, it was summer. And Lost Stars wasn't even out yet. Right. I had just gotten Lost Stars away, maybe like two months before, and I was working on a different book. And uh, my editor at Star Wars called me and was like, we need a, a book in a big hurry. Like, it would probably have to get done in about 60 days. What? I know. And I was like, I can't do it. 
I have things to do. I like, I, I literally can't do that. And she goes, it's about Leia. And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> my one thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, and I honestly probably ended up with about 40 days of writing time on that. That is um, insane. But I had a very comprehensive outline for it. And, um, but it, it, it honestly, like, it's not always the worst thing. Like you kind of get in the groove and you can't even get out of it. There isn't any time to get out of it. Sure. Um, you know, and I really loved the story a lot with that one. So that carried me through. Same, same. I'm going to say this for all three of the Star Wars books you've done, plus short story. Your writing is my favorite of the new canon. I think oh, it's, thanks. I think it's all amazing. And Bloodline was one of those that like, I remember having theories about like, you know, Kylo Ren, Ray's parentage and all this stuff. Uh -huh. And then I read your book and I was like, well, there goes all of my theories. <laughs> it just wrecked all of them. Because like maybe maybe Ray is like Luke's daughter and like, you know, Kylo was like, hey, you're supposed to train me. But then when we found out Bloodline was like five, six years before seven and yeah. Kylo's still a Jedi, we're like, whoa, hold on. Scratch yeah. everything. And I, I, yeah, I, I, I love the scene people... when... Yeah, at that point, thought that Han and Leia had broken up very early on, when in yeah. fact, you know, they really had made it work for a very long time. And, you know, I mean, we still don't know specifically, but the very strong suggestion is that they were sparked by this incredible tragedy. Right. With, and which, you know, frankly, that, you know, you that would be a thing that would test any marriage. Of so. course, of course. And I, I just, God, I loved it. The scene was so beautiful when Leia finds out, that, like, oh, it's a boy. So mm -hmm. good. that that whole yeah. book and then you have a guy who's like obsessed with the empire and leia's like what is happening here and the whole uh -huh. vote leia thing like incredible incredible i can go all day just saying how amazing this book was and I it, it was fun to do i had more on that like the other two books i got like a two-line prompt uh -huh. this gave me about a page and some of that was just political backstory sure. and it wasn't necessarily in the book but um you know i knew that napkin bombing thing would happen i knew that uh and it was called that in the outline i knew that um she would be revealed as darth vader's daughter Crazy. Um, in that draft castrofo was very much just a villain right. and had imperial artifact secret over on the side and i thought you know, it would be much more interesting to have this guy be sort of leia's political opposite but somebody she can't instantly dismiss right no, um, and have him collecting that stuff openly, and uh, and as far as he's concerned, it really is just history. Right. But of course, of course, of the book, he's like, I'm not sure that's true for my fellow collectors. Yeah, <laughs> for real. <laughs> yeah, that was great. I love the idea because, like, Lost Stars and this as well. It's like taking things that you thought you knew, and mm -hmm. then not so much. And uh, that yeah. whole deal where like the galaxy finds out, like. Leia is Vader's daughter. Like, we've known that forever. Yeah. And then you find out, oh, wow, yeah, no, we're the reader, so we know, but not everyone there does. And that that changes everything. Yeah. Like, can you and, imagine? Yeah, and that was one of the very few missed opportunities in the old EU. They did so many really great things, but you know, the beginning of Heir to the Empire, everybody knows, and, you know, yeah. some people are a little, uh, about it. But for the most part, it was like, well, sure, okay, you're Vader's kid. And... You know, I I really felt like that information would not go down that easily. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, sorry, we got we got a possible barking dog situation. Here. Oh, that's fine. All right, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Good. It's okay. It's okay. You probably this is this is a very lax show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I prefer it that way. Uh, it's just it's just better human conversation. Uh, so. Yeah. How do you even start writing such an established character? I mean, Leia's the top three, you know, yeah. um, and with yeah. and with forty and with sixty days to boot. <laughs> this is gonna sound like a joke or like I'm being glib, but it's the absolute truth. Uh -huh. You know, I saw Star Wars when it came out in 1976. I was either six or seven at the time, oh, and jealous. since then I basically, you know, there's been a part of my brain always going, "What would it be like to be Princess Leia?" Yes. You know? And finally, somebody was like, we will give you money to do this thing. Yeah. And, like, you're <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I just, I'd loved her my whole life. And, sure. and so that felt, that, that felt very natural. And also, like I said, Lost Stars hadn't come out yet. Uh -huh. And I knew that Star Wars books were widely read. I mean, I had, 
you know, a lot of the old EU, you know, I was right. there, you know, and back Same. in the 90s, I was at Walden Books, you know, in the oh, mall yeah. every month coming out with it. Um, but uh, I, I did not really understand quite how widely read. Sure. They, um, and so probably I should have been a little more intimidated than I was. I was not on either one except a little bit by the time. I was just like, oh, yeah, great. You know, and also, like, <laughs> Leia was in that book only a few years older than I am now. And, you know, the perspectives of you know, a woman in her 40s, like, that is not something that Star Wars has overdone, right. shall we say. <laughs> sure. You know, and I thought it would be interesting. You know, I mean, she's at the point – in life, she's going, okay, we won the big victory, and it didn't fix everything. Sure. And we learned these lessons, but the next generation has to learn them over again anyway. Right. You know, and um, things are mostly really good for her, and yet there are real losses. You know, I sort of say, like, midlife is when disappointments are no longer setbacks, but outcomes. Like, sometimes Ooh, just, good like, one. like, that is it. Like, you actually get your final answer on a few things. And nobody, no matter how charmed their life, is going to have some closed door that they really wish hadn't been closed. And right. so dealing with Leia there and having her still be so determined and so hopeful, but at the same time, like, really facing some of that in the face. Yeah, oh, yeah. That in the face. You know, you know why, I'm a writer. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but really having to deal with that, that was that was an exciting thing to dig into. Sure, it was great. The the her butting heads with Mon Mothma was different and awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I dug it. I did a lot. And then they brought you back to do to do Leia again, but younger. Yes. How, yes. how amazing is that? This character that you loved your whole life, you get to do him then, and then oh, you got Leia spot on. How about you do it again, but the other side of her life that we don't know about? Yeah, that was that was great. And, all, and again, one mysterious blind spots in the old EU. There was almost nothing in any canon anywhere about Brea Organa. Exactly. And I think about that. That's a massively important character. Huge. And, you know, she got a line in the movie. There was never anything much written about her. And the idea that I would and get to spend all this time on Alderaan with Bale yes. and with her, you know, and... um you know, it wasn't only about young Leia, although I was very excited to write her, but it was about sort of exploring that, that world that Leia lost. Yeah, for sure. That, that's another thing. Like, I, I absolutely loved one of my favorite things about that book was we got Alderaan's culture. We got mm -hmm. something that we hadn't seen before in the whole, like, rite passage and just the the theatrics of, you know, you have to come and then give the speech and a king and queen of Alderaan. Like, it was so cool. So cool. Yeah. Like, how would a really, how would a monarchy that is that responsive to the people, you know, and that egalitarian society, how does that work? You know, that was a exactly. fun to to dig into. Sure. And then you got uh, Holdo, which I like to call the Luna Lovegood of Star Wars because of your Yeah, that, she was definitely that from the get-go. Um, you know, and just the idea that when she was younger, she was really like almost aggressively trying to be manic pixie dream girl, you yeah. know? <laughs> uh, and, you know, by the time we catch up with her in uh, last Jedi, of course she's older. She's a seasoned military leader, but she's still got the funky hair. She does. I love it. You can tell she's still got a sense of humor, you know? Yeah, so, does. you know, it, so it was fun to sort of like, because I did get to see some of the stuff about Hollow before I wrote the book. And it was fun cool. to sit back and really have her be somebody who was, much more um i mean much more really 14 and 15 yeah for sure uh kind of kind of giddy and fun because the the hard stuff hasn't happened yet yeah exactly this is, when there was still light in her eyes <laughs> <laughs> oh man she had the single most badass thing in that whole movie though dude holdo no joke is like in my top five favorite star wars characters it's yeah. so cool and, and we, oh my god just letting you sit in it and just mm. every showing <gasps> amazing yeah. amazing what yeah. uh what was the hardest part about writing that book having come off a of bloodline now doing this chunk of leia's life and her parents and all that um, this, this is probably not the answer you're looking for but it was the truth I, I actually had what was for a star wars book a pretty lenient deadline like it was 
the better part of, I guess it was like three and a half months. Uh-huh. And I really didn't have anything else much I was working on. So I was like, this is going to be great, you sure. know. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I became very ill during oh, no. it. Uh, I mean, I'm fine. You're it good did, now. <laughs> I'm good now. It, it ultimately wound up with me having some minor surgery. Like, But I was sick. Jeez. And so that was the hardest part was, you know, there were things when the book came out, I was leafing through it because – it was like some of this, it was like, I was running a fever. I'm not sure I remember exactly what got into this chapter. Because, <laughs> you know? um, I mean, I was really not in a good way. And I did the best that I could, but ended up being a very, you know, a lot of the things I would normally do or work through with a book had to happen in a much different way, I guess. And like I said, there were literally a couple of scenes that I was like, I don't remember if it's in there or not. Wow. You know? and, I was not good. I was not good. I'm just like fever all the time. Sheesh. But, well, you know, it, it you happened. Couldn't tell. You couldn't tell. I'm glad. I'm very glad because I was, I was worried. I was like, oh, my God, like this thing's going to come out and it'd be some sort of hallucinatory. <laughs> yeah. It's all a literal fever dream. Yeah, and everybody's going to be like, what happened to her? But, um, but yeah, that, that was the big challenge on that one. Was, sure. Uh, that, was, no, that, that is a great answer. You, yeah. I have to say, my favorite scene of the book is uh, the scene with Panaka. Oh yeah, dude, you messed me up with that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was proud of that scene. You don't usually get a big emotional hit with Panaka, right? And oh boy, do you're, you get you're mean. <laughs> Whatever. Um, <laughs> That's what he gets for joining the Empire. <laughs> yeah, and also, like, I he had been a moth in the old EU, yes. and I thought it was fun to bring that forward. But sort of with it, he he was a decent person. Right. He was basically there out of loyalty to Palpatine, and he was somebody that the rebellion thought maybe they could shake. Yeah, you know, he was he was you know I think Brea says like he was by far the most senior imperial official we had any shot at. Right, and um, so it was it was a lot of fun to be able to do that and to have sort of the close call with the Naboo. And um, and also because her parents, of course, they don't know what she knows. Right. In fact, they're like, did you have a reason for going there? <laughs> right, yeah. That whole, uh, well, it's like, find out what she knows without saying it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nabu was good. Did you did you talk to anyone? Any, any, any interesting moments? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And um, like the idea that her parents, because this is the thing that is really – haunted me for a long time and i think you see it especially in rogue one but Mm -hmm. you know knowing what we now know bail organa didn't just send leia to go get obi-wan kenobi right he knows the minute he sends her back to obi-wan the minute that connection is made the like the timer's been hit the truth is gonna out right you know all these things are gonna happen luke is gonna show but he knows that right he knows that he is setting that into motion and you know the the bail we meet in uh, Princess of Alderaan. He's not ready for that yet. He's not even close to being ready for that. And sure. really, Leia probably isn't ready to hear it. Uh, and by Rogue One, we see that you know he he's he's accepted her. He realizes that she's a leader now, and that the time really has come. You know, and and he's okay with it. But I wanted to go back a couple steps. Uh, there was a lot of sort of assumption that Bail just bought Leia into the rebellion. Just like, oh, look, here's a war we're going to start. You know, okay, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, you know, even the father of a very you know, politically aware child who's going to grow up and be a leader, you know, most loving dads are not looking at their 16-year-old going, yep, they're ready for war. That's you right. Know. Time to radicalize. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also, they don't even know what shape the war is going to be. Like, what exactly are they going to do? Is it going to be a full-out war? Is it going to be a couple of strikes? Is it going to be, you know, they don't know. Sure. And so I thought it was more interesting to have him have a much more, to be much more uh, conflicted For about sure. her being involved in that. I love that scene when she goes to crate and then <laughs> she gets taken to the leader and it's bail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that good. Is, 
that is straight up an homage to the pilot of the TV show Alias. So it's amazing. Like, right. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. how it would be. Bale's like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, just like, oh, of course she's here. Ex- oh. Exactly. And that's exactly what would happen. That's what I love about your books is they're so true to Star Wars. Like, there's nothing in it where I'm like, mm, I don't know if that would happen. Like, I love it. I absolutely love it. The, my favorite moment of the entire book was Panaka looking at it like, what? You look like Padme. <laughs> yeah, and that was sort of the key thing about getting her in the dress because – Right. And then young Carrie Fisher, like, they didn't look so much alike that you would be like, oh, definitely. Right. But to have her in this outfit that he would have seen her in on multiple occasions, mm-hmm. you know, like – once you have that too, like the connection gets, I think, much easier to draw. For sure. And, uh, and it was interesting because you had to know that, I, that there were rumors around that something might have been going on with this or that. Uh, that sure. made and, and the whole, when did you say that happened? Hmm. Yeah. Because so, how? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a very public adoption. That's, hmm. Alderaan. Yeah. Bale? Yeah, it is a very public adoption. Um, <laughs> You know, I think they buried Padme supposedly pregnant, but still, yeah. You know, um, very interesting. I'm on to you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and also the adoption of the princess probably was not like a leading news story. Outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's hard to imagine Forrest like going, "Oh, Bale and Brea have a kid now." You know, I mean, they're not <laughs> just Palpatine. Everyone. <laughs> yeah, he's always sending her little booties to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Anyway. The little Senate symbol, like now the Imperial symbol. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That would be great with a little Imperial symbol. Yeah, just a onesie. Yeah. Congratulations on your new daughter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He'd use it with yarns. Too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was so, awesome. So, as elaborate as the Alderani customs are, where did you come up with that? The whole sword and like is very, very thought out. Uh, re- reminded me of you know the Princess Diaries movies. Yeah, I remember the day I found out that Genovia is not a real place, and I was so <laughs> offended. I was like, "But, but they have a national anthem and a flag." <laughs> and, hey, no, no. <laughs> and there was so much thought into Alderaan's customs. I felt the same way. I was like, "Wait I, a I actually minute." Got to meet, um, Meg Cat of Princess Diaries through uh, the "From a Certain Point of View" thing. Yeah. Oh she, my god. She did a story for that, and I have to tell you, she is delightful. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, you know, I wanted it to be the, the day of demand. I you know, I wanted it to be something that would be very active. Right. Something that really emphasized her as the monarch to be, not sort of like, oh, you're in a pretty dress. Right. Here's yes. the crown. Yeah. Here's some sparkly, you know. Um, I, I thought, like, I wanted it to be something that was more dynamic and was about her proving herself. And the idea of the challenges took shape very early, and it seemed to me like that would be a good thing for her to declare, like, she's going to take this on, and that it was a process you, you went through. Uh, and, I mean, it's and it's formality, largely. It's mm-hmm. understood that you'll manage to pull this off somehow. Yeah. Hers <laughs> winds up being a whole lot more involved and challenging than anybody would have guessed. Go figure. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was great. And then you wrote... Probably my favorite piece of Star Wars content since the new books and canon has come out. Your chapter, uh, from a certain point of view, had to come clean. Uh huh. Qui Gon Jinn is my all time favorite Star Wars character. I love Qui Gon. He's like him. number one, hands down, my favorite Star Wars character. He was like the Jedi that got it right, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and when I got to this chapter, I made noises humans shouldn't. <laughs> I was I could not tell you how excited I was to get more Qui Gon. Like mm. any time when I first saw him in the Clone Wars come back, I was like, oh, I, know I know that voice. I and know, I too. I just I lost it. Your chapter was so perfect. Like it everything about it I was like, Wow, yeah, this is exactly what it would be. It's Qui Gon again. You know? Mm. And uh so thank you for that. Uh, you know, he, I've always wanted to write him always. I want you to write no, him always. I, I hope <laughs> day will come when I'll actually get to write a novel in which he would have a big part. That would be great. Oh. But um, honestly, though, a lot of it, again, came down to the fact that they were parceling out these stories while I was really sick. Sure. And I was sort of recovered and able to ask, like, 
all the other characters were taken, you know, it was sort of like, well, you can write a magnum opus, you know, from the point of view of a do back. <laughs> and I was like, what the, and then I thought about, because I had recently uh, rewatched the very end of the clone wars. Yes. Uh, and I had also gone back and watched uh, revenge of the Sith Ooh. and you, and we're told very explicitly through clone wars and then through revenge of the Sith that Qui-Gon is, speaking again yes, he's the first one to become yeah. one with the force he doesn't take shape yet correct he's not doing that at that time but certainly obi-wan and yoda have learned how to do that very easily by that time and since qui-gon is the one who's communicating that mm-hmm. like, it stands to reason that by the end qui-gon would have been able to do it too and i didn't know how they'd be with it but when i pitched it they were like oh that's great that's perfect that's a really natural moment for you know obi-wan to have kind of a second where he's stepping back and going oh okay because he too knows the minute he sees that hologram it's like yeah, oh yeah game okay. time you know now we're going back into this and this is going to be huge. Um, I thought it was a really natural time for him to sort of reach out to that. And of course, with the Jedi, knowing that past and present and future are sort of mingled, Qui-Gon knows what's happening with Obi-Wan in a way even Obi-Wan doesn't at that point. I freaked, man. I freaked. Mm-hmm. Because the other one was like, just Force Ghost, Qui-Gon, something. Like, if there's ever a Kenobi movie, that's what I'm the most excited for. I was like, <gasps> You don't get it. He was the first Jedi to become one with the Force, and that chapter was everything I've always wanted. And I'm so glad you enjoyed it. It was so perfect. And just the idea that, like, in this, the fact that he's a Force ghost, like, I was like, all my dreams came true. So I got a, <laughs> I got a, I got a fan out on you for that. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would just want Force ghost Qui-Gon and everything. Oh, my God, for real. For oh, real. Say, Force ghost Yoda in Last Jedi. I Incredible. Was well, first of all, he's, that's the point of the movie is what he's saying. Absolutely. Failure is our teacher. But also, like, really drove home something that had always driven me bats about <laughs> prequels. I'm not a prequel hater, but, you know, I'd be lying if I said they were my favorites either. But Fair. the thing that drives me maybe the craziest is Yoda does not say one wise, meaningful <laughs> thing in the entire book, not once. Not even once. He's a bureaucrat. <laughs> that that's that's all he is, and I mean that's not Yoda, right? You know? And to have like Yoda there, really, like I mean, the first thing he basically does is go like, "You're so too Luke." Oh yeah, he, oh, just cracking up the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, are you gonna set that on fire? <laughs> I'll <know>. do it. <laughs> yeah, got it. Um, but like he was wise again. He was the teacher again. That's right. And, I loved that. So, um, yeah, so getting to do a little of that with Qui-Gon also was pretty fun. Loved it. I love that he was, like, outside of time. And then that moment when you, like, he basically apologizes to Mm Obi-Wan. He's like, my bad. Like, that was a lot of pressure. But then when Obi-Wan, like, there was a moment in that chapter where I was like, oh, wow. And it was when Qui-Gon looks at Obi-Wan and he's like, wow, even now he thinks there's so much life ahead and yeah. Qui-Gon outside of time was like, his clock is almost up. Uh-huh. Oh, man, what a powerful moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Obi-Wan fan. Oh, yeah. He's he's, and, a, he's top three for me. <laughs> I think it's obvious also. I mean, that entire story is basically Qui-Gon coming back from the dead and going, guys, Obi-Wan is so great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's really extraordinary. I mean, what was it? Like, like three of the four four people he loved the most in his life die in front of him. I know. It becomes much worse than dead. Oh, yeah. You know, um, and he has to go live, like, you know, this this despised, supposedly crazy dude on the outskirts of Tatooine, not even in beautiful metropolitan downtown Mos Eisley, no. <laughs> yeah. Not even that level of sophistication. Like, he he is on the back end of nowhere. The dude is in a uh, hut. <laughs> yeah, like, he's in a hut. And there's sand and everything. You know that there is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the fact that, as far as we know, like, Obi-Wan is never tempted to darkness. Uh, agreed. He's the, he's the model Jedi. Yeah. Like, so, uh, I love that they, like, volunteered him for everything. You know yeah. I mean? We found Grievous on Utapau, and they're just like, I think Obi Wan should do it. <laughs> yeah, Obi Wan, you do this too. You yeah, do exactly. Yeah, Honestly, one of my years favorite. in the desert. 
Yeah, one of my favorite things in all the prequels is that moment when Grievous pulls out the four lightsabers. Yeah. And see Obi-Wan's face, and he smiles. I love it. Like, that's just awesome. Agreed. Agreed. And you got to write Obi-Wan. I did. Dude. Dude. Obi-Wan. I'm so happy to hear that, like, the people behind this stuff are also crazy fan. Like, you're one of us. That's so, oh, that's, yeah. that's so great. It, it's totally true, and I, you know, um, and it's true across the board. You know, the people that I talk with at at Lucas and Publishing, like everybody loves it. Everybody's having fun with it. It's it, you know, we just get to nerd out together. It's so great. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, now we have more barking dogs. <laughs> they they also love it. Yes, barking dogs. Agree. Four out of five barking dogs agree. That's right. That's right. Well, yeah. I've taken up uh, a lot of your time. I just looked at the. <laughs> the time goodness thank you so much for for taking the time i really really appreciate it this has been fun this is a lot of fun i'm so glad to hear that that is that is my goal with these uh well, mission accomplished yeah <laughs> thank you very much uh <laughs> where can people find you online um my website is probably the best place uh it's www.claudiagray.com that's gray with an a i've actually been taking a little bit of a vacation from social media but i have a new book coming out next month so i will shortly be returning but at my website there are links that will take you to my tumblr my twitter my facebook so wherever you hang out online you'll probably find the link to it there sweet sounds good thank you again thank you and Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of uh, The Interesting Podcast. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Jedi Brian. If you want to follow the show, it's at Pot of Interest on Twitter. And uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, if you wouldn't mind, go to iTunes and give it a five-star rating. That pushes us to the front of uh, the iTunes algorithm, and it helps book guests. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate you listening. Until next time, be well.